Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Florida School Counselor Association webinar. This is an introduction to poly victimization for school counselors. Uh, we have Stacy Pendarvis from the Monique Burr Foundation for Children. She's the program director. Uh, and uh, so, Stacy, I know we've got till 4:30. We're getting just a little bit of a late start, so I know you're anxious to keep moving. Uh, I will be uh, monitoring the questions area. So, if you have some questions, go ahead and type those in. And uh, periodically, we'll go ahead and pause and see uh, if we can get your questions answered. We will not be using the chat area, but instead using the questions area. This uh, webinar is being recorded, and so we'll make available to you not only the replay, but also the PowerPoint and any other files uh, for you to download. Stacy, they're all yours. Thank you. Um, sorry, we've got to turn this second computer off. Okay. okay, let's try that. Good afternoon, everyone. Sorry about the technical difficulties. We, we had everything tested nice and, and well, and then we tried to start, and it wouldn't work. So that's typical for um, technology sometimes. But thank you for joining us. Um, happy to, to be here this afternoon and um, to be sharing a little bit about uh, poly victimization and how it um, is important for counselors in the schools today working with, um, with students. So we'll go ahead and get started. We, we are a little bit short of time, but I think we'll still be, be, be good. So um, just quickly a little bit about the Monique Burr Foundation for Children, and I'm going to hopefully um, show you via video a little bit from our founder, Ed Burr. Hello, I'm Ed Burr, founder of the Monique Burr Foundation for Children. As a legacy to my late wife, Monique, and her passion for keeping children safe, the foundation was formed in 1997 on the one-year anniversary of her death in 1996. The foundation continues to provide today bullying, child abuse, and digital abuse prevention education in our schools. Although our strategies may have changed over time, our vision remains the same. We know that the only way to truly protect children is through prevention education. I want to thank you for joining us, and thank you for what you do every day to keep our children safe. So we, we provide prevention education to um, children, to adults, and we're a very small team. So um, obviously, I'm the program director, as um, Russ um, shared with you in the beginning. Our executive director is Lynn Layton, and then we have several others on staff. But we're, we're a small team, um, but we are pretty effective, I think, for, for the few staff members that we have. And I'll share some of that with you as we progress through the, through the um, webinar today. So really, why are we here talking about poly victimization? Um, I mean, you work in the schools with children, and I have to say right up front, I really, really respect and admire you all for that. Um, I have three daughters, two in middle school, one in high school, and that's about the, the max number of kids I can, I can handle. So you go to school every day, and you work with so many kids, and um, just praise you for that, because it's, I, I know that's a challenging position, and um, so many kids are um, traumatized and they experience so many different things in life and and that makes your job even more challenging and they the goal of, of school is obviously for academic success and to educate kids and but what they experience in their lives is um, is it impacts that um, goal and, and the outcomes in, in classrooms and in school so I think that this is important because the, um, the information and the the victimization, the traumas, the experiences that children um, have, it really does alter their path. And that's what we're going to share to you today, share with you today. So first of all, we know Florida is a great place. Florida has, we have beautiful beaches. Um, we have great theme parks and a lot of things to do. Disney World has always been a favorite. And um, you know, here I'm sharing a picture just because I always do, of my two of my three children um, at the beach. And so we know that Florida is a, is a wonderful state. And um, there's lots of great things about our state, but there's also lots of not so great things about our state. Um, we rank fourth in the nation pretty consistently year after year in abuse, the number, numbers of child abuse. Um, we rank third for trafficking, for calls to the human trafficking hotline. 
And Central Florida ranks second in the nation for cases of domestic minor sex trafficking. So as far as um, you know, what we have as to, to our claim to fame, some of the things that we have um, are not so great. And we, we really need to work on those, and we are working on those. There's a lot of things happening in our state to, to better those situations. And so I'm going to share some of that information with you as well. Um, the National Child Traumatic Stress Network reports that one out of every four children attending school has, has been exposed to a traumatic event that can affect their learning or school behavior. So in, in your school, think about how many kids that would be. Think about walking into a classroom and how many school or how many children that means have been impacted by some sort of trauma. Um, you know, some of that is probably not news to you. Um, you know that kids are impacted by bullying and abuse. You see that, I'm sure, pretty consistently, or you have seen it at least um, at, throughout your career if you've been a counselor for a while. So um, bullying, we know that bullying is an issue that kids face pretty consistently. And there, there are issues with bullying and some things that are not necessarily bullying by definition that, that we, get, um, we see in the schools. I understand that. but. But it is, con it is consistently a problem that we see. Um, Cyberbullying, the Department of Justice reports that one in five students has or will um, experience cyberbullying. And that is, you know, it's a bigger problem sometimes even kids facing cyberbullying because they can't get away from it. They, they can't um, leave it at the school, school playground. They take it home with them and they, um, they experience it 24-7. So it's a huge issue as well. Child abuse, the numbers of child abuse are, um, they, they just are, um, they're an epidemic in their, in their nature. Um, neglect, obviously, is the largest percentage, but abuse and sexual abuse are, are, not, are not small numbers, to be sure. And we look at the, the ages, and many young children are um, impacted by child abuse. And then, of course, we have to look at exploitation as well trafficking, pornography, child sexual abuse images. It's a huge, huge issue, and it's growing. Um, and Florida is not immune. Some people think that it happens elsewhere, or it's not really a problem in our country or our state. And if you're not really um, familiar with how bad this problem has become or, or is, you need, to, um, you need to really kind of do some research and study up on this. Uh, human trafficking or sex trafficking, it really has become a huge issue and is second in um, crime only to um, now um, drugs. Um, it has surpassed the illegal sale of um, arms in our country and is second now as a criminal activity only to the sale of drugs in our country. So um, here's a, just a quick trailer for a video that um, portrayed, that was aired in here in um, Central Florida. If I can get it to play, here we go. It is in our backyard. It looked like exploding. What the hell was going on? The whole night she raped me. Human trafficking is here. It's the fastest growing crime. Unfortunately, it is extremely fast. We have a very significant problem. So um, it's very dark and it's very um, hard to watch, but that, that video, that movie, or, or that documentary is available online to watch. Um, but it does give you a realistic portrayal of how bad that problem is in Central Florida. And um, if, you, if you have the time, I would suggest or recommend that you, you do go online and watch that because it is, um, it, it, oh, sorry about that, it is, um, eye-opening and it is enlightening as to what um, our, our youth are experiencing. So I want to just um, ask some questions the rest of the time that we have uh, today's webinar and answer some questions. And that is, what is polyvictimization and why does it matter? What does the research say? And then what do we do about it? And so really polyvictimization as a word or as a, as a concept means that it's when a victim suffers from multiple or more than one type of victimization or trauma. 
sometimes it is defined and it does this is not an accurate definition it is not multiple events of a single type of trauma or victimization so when you hear the word poly victimization it is it is different types of victimization suffered um, by one person for example a child who is sexually abused at home and then later sexually assaulted or bullied at school that is a poly victim versus someone that is sexually assaulted by peers on different occasions, that is not a poly victim. Um, and so it is really, um, it's becoming an alarming issue and it, the, the research for poly victimization stems from the ACE study and I'll talk about that in just a minute, um, but the numbers are staggering. So here's an example. Children that um, are physically assaulted by a caretaker are 60% more likely than other children to also be assaulted by a peer. Um, there's, there was a, a national study done, and it was pretty substantial, actually, um, led by David Finkelhor and also um, Heather Turner, Sherry Hamby, and Richard Ormrod. Sorry. Um, and it was fairly, it was more recent. It was um, 2011. The, the results were published. And some of the numbers really are kind of alarming. A child who was physically assaulted in the past year from that study would be five times as likely also to have been sexually victimized and more than four times as likely also to have been maltreated during that same period. Similarly, a child who was physically assaulted during that past year um, or in his or her lifetime would be more than six times as likely to have been sexually victimized and more than five times as likely to have been maltreated during his or her lifetime. So you can see from those numbers that poly victimization really is a substantial issue with many, many um, youth. And why does that matter for us? What is the difference between a child that is victimized in a, in a singular um, type of trauma versus a child that is victimized multiple um, types of victimization? Uh, what, what the studies have found is that the trauma is much more substantial from these complex types of victimization or traumas. Um, and it leads to oftentimes um, in their future jail, substance abuse, um, and oftentimes early death. And this research stems from the ACE study. And I'll tell you about that. Um, if you are not familiar with the ACE study, the Adverse Childhood Experiences study, um, that's something you really should be familiar with. So the ACE study was done in the late 90s by Kaiser Permanente and the Centers for Disease Control. And it was a large um, study done um, asking adults about their childhood experiences. And what they did was, after the adults reported on the different experiences that they had as a child, abuse, domestic violence in their home, parental, um, parental uh, domestic violence, parental substance abuse, um, different experiences that they suffered as a child, and then they looked at their adult outcomes, so physical well-being, emotional well-being, social well-being, um, physical health, and different chronic diseases and things like that. They added them up and they, um, the, the adult actually got what they call an ACE score. Um, and so if you look at this, this number here, 95%, it was a, there was a 95% likelihood that additional types of childhood traumas would accompany a single ACE, and that leads back to that polyvictimization research. Um, what they found was that ACEs were common, very common in most um, people. As an ACE score increased, so did the risk for smoking, chronic disease, substance abuse, depression, um, domestic violence, and early death. In fact, ACEs determine the likelihood of the 10 most common causes of death in the United States. So that's um, pretty scary. And then what does the research say about polyvictimization? One of the main researchers in this field is David Finkelhor. Um, he's at the Crimes Against Children Research Center in New Hampshire, very well versed in um, a lot of different concepts and topics, topics in, in bullying, um, cyberbullying, child abuse, polyvictimization. And what the research says, and he's done numerous kind of um, studies and, and inquiries into the polyvictimization research, um, and this kind of, I think, started in the mid-2000, kind of 2008-2009, um, is what they found is the children were exposed to even children who were exposed to even one type of violence both within the past year and over their lifetimes were at a far greater risk as we talked about 
Then they started doing additional research about what that meant for um, professionals in the field. And the priority is that really those, those children need closer, we need to focus more on those children because of their vulnerability to um, ending up in the welfare and the mental health system, jail, and that sort of thing. And so a lot of now their research is trending in that area of what are our interventions, what do our interventions need to look like, and also leading up to what does prevention look like in that area. They've identified pathways of prevention and how do we need, what do we need to focus on. And so if you see here, they're talking about we need to um, use multiple um, and complex, more comprehensive types of programs rather than focusing on a singular type of prevention program. We need to, we need to focus on a comprehensive type of program and um, focus on strategies that teach um, prevention in a very complex manner so that we're teaching children and adults um, strategies for reducing uh, multiple types of traumas and victimizations in one program. We don't need to necessarily teach internet safety or sexual abuse prevention, but rather teach strategies for preventing um, victimization and trauma together. And so we know that kids need help. We know that they need protection. And we, as the adults, need to act. We need to teach them strategies. There's a kind of a dichotomy in, in the philosophy of how do we prevent kids from being victimized. There's the one side that says we need to educate adults, and there's the other side that says we need to educate children. And then really there's the um, philosophy that we need to do both. Everyone agrees that it's the responsibility of adults to protect children, but there, it's the responsibility of adults to also educate children on how to protect themselves. So we educate children on bike safety. We educate children. Erin Marin, who um, is going around the country trying to get her Erin's law passed, she says she was taught tornado drills and fire drills and safety drills in schools, but no one ever taught her how to be safe from abuse. And um, that's something that that the research supports is um, doing that now to, to help children learn strategies, empower them and educate them in how they can help adults keep them safe. So what do we need to do based on the research? Um, what do we need to do to protect children? Well, the research supports educating children using school-based program, programs. It also um, says that the, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children gives us guidelines on how to select programs. And there are programs also available for adults. So we know that there are great programs out there and that we have programs available for use based on this latest research on polyvictimization. So the research supports edu educating children. And what does it say? It tells us, and, and this is where the, the research is really important, because the research, we always go back to what does the research tell us? Is it effective to educate children in schools? Is it effective to educate children at all? And David Finkelhor's research um, says that educating children against abuse and trauma, against bullying, against all of the different types of victimizations that occur for poly, in poly victims is effective, that kids learn the concepts, that they retain the concepts, and that they are able to um, utilize those behavioral mechanisms. He explains that school-based educational programs teach children how to identify situations. Um, it also aims in, to promote disclosure, reduces self-blame. And so there's a lot of good things that come from these types of programs. Um, but he also says sometimes the, the results are inconclusive depending on what's actually in the programs. And he um, promotes further research. This study was conducted in 2009. He just recently came out with a new study and this study, um, he did effectively show that um, there are programs available now that kids can learn the concepts when there are certain criteria met within the program. And so he talks about some of those programs in this newer study. This, um, this actual um, study here, Youth Exposure to Violence Prevention Programs, a national sample, this is actually in print right now in the journal Child Abuse and Neglect. Um, and so this will be um, out very soon, and this is a very strong, um, supportive article for child abuse prevention and comprehensive po um, poly-victimization programs in 
uh, schools educating children. There was also a study done and it kind of looked at a lot of different programs that were grant funded by the, the government and um, how were they effective in schools and the, re the results of that was that there was a lot of good things about um, school-based programs. They educated a large number of students and it educated not only students but often teachers and if there was a parent component, parents as well. And so teachers learned how to um, use appropriate discipline, how to nurture children um, in nonviolent ways, how to um, administer discipline. They learned how to report abuse, what the signs and symptoms were. Um, and so there was a lot of good, um, good outcomes from, from some of those programs. Also, participants demonstrated an increased understanding um, reporting and, and investigations. And there was also an increase in teachers' ability and willingness to report, which is good because we know sometimes adults, whether they're teachers or others, they see abuse, um, don't always know it's abuse or neglect. Um, sometimes that, as you as a professional counselor know, that sometimes that's a subtle um, line. And if you're not trained, you might not recognize those indicators. Um, so there was a lot of good that came out of that research as well that supported school-based programs. So one of the programs that we at the Monique Burr Foundation for Children offer to schools, elementary schools in Florida, and we offer them to public elementary schools at no cost, is the MBF Child Safety Matters Program. And it, it has a component, it's obviously a program aimed at children, but it has a component that educates teachers and it educates parents as well. We train facilitators, counselors, some of you may have um, been trained as a facilitator, might be using the program. Um, and we do follow the research that says that it, a comprehensive program that addresses all types of uh, abuse and trauma and bullying, cyberbullying, digital safety is um, the best means to protect children. So we incorporate all of that information into the program. And so our um, outcomes so far have been pretty, pretty good. We're seeing um, not, even as a secondary program, we're seeing a lot of um, disclosures from students after they attend the program in about um, just about half of the schools that have reported to us um, after using the program there's been at least one disclosure and then in about half of those schools they've had more than one disclosure but we um, we want to know it does it work as a secondary program so um, I'm gonna let our executive director Lynn Layton tell you a little more about that program through um, video. Hi, I'm Lynn Layton, Executive Director of the Monique Burr Foundation for Children, also known as MBF. I'd like to share with you a bit about the history and development of the program, MBF Child Safety Matters. The MBF Child Safety Matters program is researched, practical in its implementation model, and supported by experts and partner agencies in both the education and child abuse prevention fields. The program was originally created in 2009 as Speak Up Be Safe by a national development team that included Child Help, a nationally recognized child abuse prevention organization, Arizona State University, a leading research university, and the Monique Burr Foundation for Children, a longtime abuse prevention leader in Florida. Together with the Florida Cooperative Education Planning Team, including partners from the Florida Department of Education, Department of Children and Families, and the Governor's Office. This team developed the best, most comprehensive, age and developmentally appropriate, research-based prevention education curriculum designed to educate and empower students, school staff, parents and guardians with knowledge and strategies to prevent and respond to bullying, cyberbullying, and all forms of child abuse and exploitation. During the 2013-2014 school year, after substantial literature reviews and interviews with subject matter experts and updates, the program was officially launched as MBF Child Safety Matters. It meets Florida Statute 39 to provide child abuse prevention education in Florida schools, meets best practices in prevention education, and assists Florida's elementary schools in their efforts to meet the legislative requirements of the updated Jeffrey Johnston Stand Up for All Students Act, requiring cyberbullying prevention education for students, staff, faculty, and parents in public schools. 
This program works because it was created with schools, not for schools, and meets their needs for a practical, implementable prevention education program. With a distinguished development history, notable updates, and ongoing data showing that MBF Child Safety Matters effectively educates and empowers children and adults with information and strategies to help prevent bullying, cyberbullying, digital abuse, and all forms of child abuse and exploitation, MBF Child Safety Matters is unmistakably the preeminent safety and prevention education program available in Florida designed to prevent... Oops. Okay. So, I think Lynn is done, but that's okay. <laughs> So um, you get an idea of what the program is about and how it was developed, what the history is. Um, and in a short period of time, we've had a lot of success with um, MBF Child Safety Matters. So um, the pilot was programmed, the program was piloted, I'm sorry, um, starting in late 2009 um, through 2010. Um, it was developed as Speak Up, Be Safe, as Lynn explained piloted in first, third, and fifth grades, and we reached um, almost 19,000 students during the pilot phase. During um, the 2011 and 2012 school year, and implementing throughout that year in first through fifth grades, we reached 87,000 students. And then last year, implementing in first through fifth grades, we reached 172,000 students. So during the summer, we updated the program and we added um, or we aligned the program with Common Core Standards, and now uh, apparently we're going to have to change that because Florida's changing to the Florida Standards. But um, that's one thing that we always strive to do with the program is to keep it up to date and keep it um, the, the most current program that we have um, to offer to, to our counselors in the schools. Um, so we revised it and re-released it with the alignment of Common Core Standards. And then, so it was released as Subs 2.0 or Speak Up, Be Safe 2.0. So in February, we, um, we did rebrand it, and it's now MBF Child Safety Matters. And I'm going to see if I can move this so I can see my numbers. Here we go. Um, and then, oops, I'm sorry. To date, in, during this school year, we have reached 176,000 students. So in the three full years, we've reached 454,000 students to date in Florida public elementary schools. So not bad for a very small team, um, but that's because we have facilitators um, in the elementary schools who believe in the program and implement the program because they want their students to be safe and they support their students and they understand the value of um, offering a program like this to try to prevent the victimizations that we've been talking about um, that are affecting so many students um, and children. So we're approved in, in 53 counties, um, and here's um, the counties. The counties in blue have approved the curriculum or the program, and um, not all are implementing um, to date. Most are implementing at least some, some schools within those um, districts. Some are implementing, obviously, at a higher rate than others. Um, and so we're, we're working to get this entire map blue so that everyone is approved. And, and our ultimate goal is to get the program implemented in every elementary school in Florida. And then we have our certified facilitators trained to date. And we have, I believe, our number now is um, close to 1,100 certified facilitators. Not all are active currently implementing, but I believe close to 900 are actively implementing of those. Some people get trained as professional development, teachers get trained as professional development and other professionals, but um, active facilitators are around 900 to date. And then again, these are our, this is a chart that shows you the students trained that we just went through those numbers. Our students receiving the program, I'm sorry. So does it work? We know, like as I shared with you, that secondarily it works. Um, primary prevention, we, it's hard to measure, but we, we do know that we need to do um, an evidence-based research study for the program. Um, our schools are, are, are requesting that, and so are our funders, and we know that we need to do that. We wanted the program to be aligned with the standards that Florida was going to use, and we wanted the program to be stable after a few years of 
um, asking the schools what worked for them. We, we pride ourselves on the program being um, implementable and practical for schools, so we feel that we're now in a position to um, offer to have that that study be done, and the program is at a stable place that it can that it can be a um, a good study, and and the results um, actually give us some good data. So um, we do have a proposal. Um, the proposal, sadly for me, is from Florida State because I'm a Gator fan, and our office is kind of split down the middle, Florida Gators and um, Florida State, but. Our founder, Ed Burr, is a trustee at Florida State, so they are going to um, do our study, we believe. And so I just had to show you my other daughter, but she was at a, we were at a Gator softball game. So that's my third daughter there, and she's the middle one, so I had to put her by herself because she always kind of gets left out. So um, I had to make her a little special today. So, um, but hopefully we'll have some good um, information for you at the end of the school year and um, some good data to, to give to, funders and to our facilitators who are working so hard to implement the program that it does work. And then the other thing I wanted to share with you was the, um, the, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children and their guidelines and what they say um, people should look for in a program, a safety program um, for children. And this program does meet the majority of um, what their guidelines are. There are a couple that partially meet, that it partially meets or doesn't meet. And, um, I highlighted those for you. We do not instruct children um, on naming personal body parts. Um, we actually tell them what private body parts are. They are the, the parts of your body that are covered with a bathing suit, front and back, top and bottom. Um, but we don't, it, uh, we don't ask our facilitators to actually use the terminology in the schools. We ask parents through the information that goes home to parents to do that with their child, and hopefully parents are doing that. The other part is um, the training is not, we don't have a specific special needs program, but it has been adapted by actually quite a few facilitators for use with their special need um, students in schools. And then we don't have the comprehensive evaluation yet. That will be done hopefully this school year. So um, you can see that we meet most of these criteria and that, um, that for us is, is pretty, um, pretty good that we um, developed this program and meet the criteria as set forth by one of the really um, leaders in the field of prevention that we are meeting all of their guidelines. Stacey, we do offer one Stacey. other program, and I want to tell you about that. Stacey, I wanted to uh, just interrupt and remind people that we have about 20 minutes, so if they have any questions, now would be the time to type those in, and uh, we'll try to get okay. to them here between now and then. Great. Thanks, Russ. And then I wanted to just, um, before we finish up, share um, another program that we offer. and. Um, we have offered this program primarily in here in, I'm in, our office is located in Jacksonville, Duval County, even though um, the program MBF Child Safety Matters is available throughout Florida. This um, other program that we offer, Darkness to Light, Stewards of Children, is um, we primarily have provided it in Duval County to date, and we have trained um, so far, about 50 Duval school counselors with the program, and they were very impressed by it. It's a national program, um, and many, many school systems throughout the country are using it. It is, it is child sexual abuse specific, but they have expanded that now into technology and trafficking and are looking at some of the other um, areas that they need to educate adults based on the poly-victimization research. So um, I have just a short two-minute video that explains um, some about the program, and so I wanted to share that with you as well. I grew up in the picture-perfect family. I was called the debutante Miss America. I was the first Miss America that they ever brought a family up on stage. My father continued to sexually violate children and teenagers until he died at age 75. I still cannot even say what really happened other than he sex that sexual action we had in front of him. I still can't say it. I don't know if I ever will. And that's what I feel that was taken from me, um, my virginity, uh, my youth. You're never the same after that. 
what I've heard from um, heard from people who abuse often is that all of the signs were there, but no one bothered to ask them about it. No one in their family, no one in their work. And we need to learn how to see what's going on and begin to ask questions. Whether you're a mandated reporter or not, it's your moral obligation to stand up for children. We have to understand that doing the right thing is not doing the easy thing. Law enforcement is never going to investigate, investigate their way out of these type of crimes, these crimes against children. It's only through prevention that we can help stem the tide you spare one's off. And people don't have a clue to the ripples from one job. So you stop one source of ripples, and that is huge. So Stewards of Children is a program that, um, again, like I said, is offered to adults. And as um, Jerry Glover just shared, you know, the ripples are, um, I think, what, what I want to leave you with today after talking about the polyvictimization of so many kids. Um, you know, those numbers that I shared with you earlier are just, to me, staggering that um, you walk into a classroom or you look around your school and there are so many children that are suffering from from so many types of um, victimization and and that's kind of overwhelming when you think about it but what I think about is that we can do something about it and you can do something about it as one person um, with with programs that we know that that work um, MBF Child Safety Matters is a research-based program that we know is, is changing lives. Some of the stories that we hear from our facilitators about students coming up to them and bringing a friend who hasn't been through the program and saying, bringing that friend to a counselor and saying, you know, here, this is the lady I told you about. She can help keep you safe. Tell her the story that you told me. That's powerful. And, and so we know that it's um, impacting kids. And, and Stewards of Children is a program that um, you can go through or you can have made available to your parents so they can learn how to better protect their, their children. It, um, so together we know that, that by offering both of these programs, we really do stand a better chance of um, changing the future for, for students. So um, I think that was our goal of, of sharing this information with you today is, you know, we often try to compartmentalize um, bullying or cyberbullying or abuse, but I think the goal is to understand that for most students who are victimized, we can't compartmentalize that abuse um, or that trauma because for most students, it's not um, just the one time that they suffer. It's more than that, and we have to try to prevent that. And so um, there are things that you can do and there are things that we can do, and we have a lot of resources to offer and, and help you. And um, we will most definitely share some of those when we share the, the PowerPoint with Russ afterwards. And so I just encourage you to um, use those resources and to take what, what we've provided as just an introduction and to learn more about this, um, the polyvictimization of our children and how we can help protect them more in the future. And so I want to leave you um, today with just a quote. Um, that I think is important in what you do. Um, few will have the greatness to bend history itself, but each of us can work to change a small portion of events. It is from numberless, diverse acts of courage and belief that human history is shaped. Each time a man stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope and crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring those ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. And what you're doing every day to help children is amazing to us, and we appreciate your agreeing with us that Child Safety Matters and partnering with us. And we want to thank you for being here today and learning um, more about how you can help protect children. So thank you, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to, to answer them. Well, thank you, Stacy. Um, I don't see any questions right now, so it looks like uh... We'll go ahead and finish up. 
uh, but I will remind everyone that we will announce the replay. Uh, we will also have uh, the files available to you, and people can reach you directly, I imagine. Can you just go and tell us what the website address is? Absolutely. www.moniqueburrfoundation.org. Very good. And we'll go ahead and put that link up there with the replay as well. So, uh, Stacy Pendarvis from the Monique Burr Foundation for Children, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you all. We do hope to see you uh, in late October for the Florida School Counselor Association Convention in Orlando. It'll be our 50th anniversary. We're very excited about that, and we definitely hope to see you there. Thank and you again, Stacy. Yep, we'll thank see you there. You. Okay, thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.